so now we will study about the cholera cholera is a gastrointestinal infection and uh, there have been many epidemic or rather pandemics of cholera but now this disease has been controlled and the pandemics or epidemics are very rare so we will read uh, in detail about the cholera because cholera is also asked uh, uh, as a very long question in the university exams uh, giving you a clinical scenario like of a uh, a, a number of people from the same city are presenting to the to a hospital with the rice water stool so in that case you have to suspect it a case of cholera and then you have to answer the given questions following that okay so we will start with the causative organism of the cholera so cholera is caused by vibrio vibrios okay these vibrios are the gram negative bacilli and they are motile but what type of flagella they have they have monotrichous flagella this is important for mcq and uh, other uh, bacteria which are having this monotrichous flagella are the pseudomonas and campylobacter so i wanted you to read these two bacteria also along with the vibrio so that you can remember all these three bacteria together uh, as they all have the monotrichous flagella okay so this is all about the vibrio now we'll go for the classification of the vibrio so the vibrios have been classified based on the salt requirement and based on the o antigen okay so based on the salt requirement they are classified into the non halophilic vibrios and the halophilic vibrios what is this halophilic halo means you must know from your chemistry knowledge that halo means salt and philis philic means the affection phil phil means uh, affection and halo means salt so salt affection means salt loving vibrios and non halophilic that's that's why the non halophilic means non salt loving vibrios okay so by the name you can uh, derive the features or the characteristics of those vibrios so if we talk about the halophilic vibrios then if we talk about the halophilic vibrios then uh, by the name you can know that they are halophiles means they are salt loving vibrios that means they cannot grow without salt that's why they are salt loving the optimum growth will of course will be high so it is optimum growth is seen at 7% salt concentration and since they are salt loving so they can grow at higher salt concentration as well like more than 7% salt concentration also uh, at at more than 7% salt concentration also they can grow very easily and the non halophilic non halophilic vibrios are just opposite to all these characteristics like uh, they cannot they can grow without salt even when there is no salt uh, in the media then also they can grow this is in direct contrast with the halophilic vibrios on one hand the halophilic vibrios cannot grow without salt but the non halophilic vibrios can grow without salt so that is in a direct uh, uh, you know direct contrast between the two uh, vibrios but still the non halophilic vibrios so optimum growth at 1% salt concentration okay and uh, if we increase the salt concentration to more than 10 percent or 15 percent then the growth of this non halophilic vibrios will be halted they will be unable to grow in that very high salt concentration now you have to remember some of the examples for the halophilic vibrios and the non halophilic vibrios because these are uh, important equations for viva as well the examples are very commonly asked in vivas so how can you remember the non halophilic vibrios you can remember it by the mnemonic cm you know the chief minister they have many political works many uh, political conflicts so they have very high blood pressure that means and blood pressure is directly related to salt that means they uh, the cm should restrict the salt intake so by cm you can remember that non salt loving vibrios okay so cm should restrict the uh, salt intake to uh, reduce his blood pressure so by that mnemonic you can remember the names that is c for vibrio cholerae and m for vibrio mimicus okay 
and uh, talking about the halophilic vibrios we have got two examples that is the vibrio parahemolyticus and vibrio alginolyticus now coming to the next classification that is based on o antigen so based on o antigen the classification is like this so vibrio cholerae based on o antigen has been divided into different zero groups like o1 o139 and known o1 or O139. O1 uh, zero group which is there is responsible for all the pandemics that has occurred till date while O139 is responsible for the epidemics for several epidemics in the India. Remember O1 is responsible for pandemics okay and O139 is for epidemics. What is the difference between pandemic and epidemic? Pandemic means when a disease is occurring in a large geographical area involving many continents okay while epidemics means uh, if a disease is occurring in a small local area or in a small geographical area then it will be like a country so it will be then it will be called as an epidemic so that's the difference between epidemic and the pandemic so o1 causes the pandemic and o139 has caused different epidemics in india but non o1 or 139 leaving these two non-139 non-01 or 139 uh, involves all those vibrio cholerae which are not o139 or o1 okay so leaving behind the o1 and o139 all other vibrio cholerae are together called as non-01 or 139 vibrio cholerae so we are more concerned about o1 uh, vibrio cholerae why because it it is responsible for most of the pandemics uh, that has occurred till date and this O1 zero group has been classified again. Uh, I mean, uh, it has got two different biotypes. The biotypes are classical biotype and the E1 tor biotype. So, classical biotype, uh, which is there, is responsible for the first six pandemics, while E1 tor biotype is responsible for the seventh pandemic. So, remember that the Vibrio cholerae has till date caused total seven pandemics, out of which the initial six pandemics were caused by this classical biotype while the seventh pandemic was caused by the even tor biotype okay now uh, sometimes the difference between the classical biotype and even tor biotype is uh, asked so you have to remember this difference also so uh, the there are four points of difference the first point is the beta hemolysis in the slip blood agar so this is negative no beta hemolysis is seen in case of classical biotype but uh, even tor biotype shows positive beta hemolysis means it shows hemolysis okay and vp test vp test means bogus cross cover test this is negative in case of the classical biotype but it is positive in case of the even tor biotype and the next is the susceptibility to the polymyxin b so uh, the classical biotype is susceptible to this polymyxin B while even tor biotype is resistance to polymyxin B. The group 4 phase susceptibility if we talk then classical biotype is susceptible to the classical biotype is susceptible to group uh, 4 bacteriophage while even tor biotype is resistant to the class uh, group 4 phase uh, group for bacteriophage so these are the four differences one should must remember these four differences because uh, it becomes a very important question in viva uh, if you are answering all the questions well then the examiner tend to ask this difference between the classical biotype and the even tor biotype so this is all about the classification of the vibrios uh, between the based on the um, based, on, based on the o1 antigen and based on the salt requirements now coming to the pathogenesis of cholera remember the pathogenesis of the cholera is toxin mediated it is mediated by cholera toxin so we will see the pathogenesis right from entry of the bacteria into the gut till the um, you know till the appearance of the symptoms so first there is ingestion of the contaminated food remember how does the bacteria will enter inside the gut any git infection occurs by the contaminated food and water this is true for all the git infections okay so here also this is also git infection so here also the infection will start with the ingestion of the 
contaminated food and water which is contaminated with the cholera vibrio cholerae bacilli now remember the bacterial load in case of the cholera is very important if the bacterial load is less than 10 to the power 8 then there will be no cholera infection only if when the bacterial load only when the bacterial load is um, only when the bacterial load is more than 10 to the power 8 eight bacilli in the food or water then only cholera is going to happen otherwise there will be no symptoms of cholera okay so suppose the uh, the bacteria in 10 to the power 8 amount entered through food and water into the human body into the gut through the food or water now as it reaches the epithelial cells of the uh, stomach then uh, it crosses the mucin layer by virtue of the motility and proteolytic enzymes so we know that it has a uh, vibrio cholerae has got some monotrichous flagella by which uh, uh, it has gets it has got its motile property so uh, it provides its uh, it provide it its motility and also it has got some uh, release it it uh, uh, has got some proteolytic enzymes which it releases to Cross the mucin layer we know that in the stomach there is gastric mucosal barrier so that gastric mucosal barrier is crossed by virtue of this moti uh, by this by virtue of its motility and the proteolytic enzymes that it secretes now the bacteria has entered in the so this is the gastric mucosa and these are the epithelial cells and this is our gastric mucosa okay so sorry this is our uh, gastric mucosal barrier okay so bacteria is here bacteria is here it has crossed this and now uh, it is going to adhere to the epithelium by type 4 fimbria type 4 fimbria which is toxin coagulated pilus the name of that is toxin coagulated pilus so it crosses this it crosses this gastric mucosal barrier with the help of motility and the proteolytic enzymes with the help of this motility and the proteolytic enzymes and then it adheres to these epithelial cells it adheres to these epithelial cells with the help of type 4 fimbri okay after binding to the epithelial cells it releases the toxin okay then it releases the toxin and its toxin has got two fragments okay it has got two fragments the fragment a and the fragment b so first we'll see about the fragment b because fragment b helps in the entry of fragment a so what does that fragment b do uh, that the fragment a gets entry inside the cell so fragment b binds to the gm1 gangliosite receptors and it uh, binding to that gm1 gangliosite remember this gangliosite this may be asked in mcq so uh, binding to that gm1 gangliosite helps in the internalization of fragment a now come to the fragment a what does that fragment a do that fragment a causes adp ribosylation causes adp ribosylation of the g protein so as there is adp ribosylation then there is increased activity of the adenylyl cyclase and we know by the knowledge of biochemistry that adenylyl cyclase breaks down the atp into cyclic amp so as the adenylyl cyclase gets activated it is converting atp to cyclic amp and the amount of cyclic amp increases okay so that cyclic amp inhibits the na plus absorption by inhibiting the sodium channels and activates the chloride ion secretion okay activates the chloride ion secretion okay so uh, these two functions by uh, occurs uh, by the increase in the camp how does that occur because camp inhibits the sodium channels and activates the chloride ion channels so that's why the na plus absorption is inhibited but the secretion of chloride ions from the cells increases now suppose this is gut uh, uh, uh okay so suppose this is the gut lumen okay and from here the na plus absorption na plus absorption is getting inhibited that means the na plus increases that means the na plus increases inside the that means the na plus that means the 
Na plus increases inside the lumen and on other on other hand it activates the chloride ion movement inside the lumen okay it increases the chloride ion movement inside the lumen that means the amount of Na plus as well as Cl minus increases in the lumen they together forms the they together form they together form the NaCl okay they together form the NaCl in the lumen now when the concentration of NaCl increases concentration increases in the lumen then what happens uh, by virtue of osmolarity the water is uh, drawn inside the lumen from the cells or from the uh, mucosa okay so or from the blood vessel so the water is drawn into the lumen as a result the water inside the lumen increases the concentration of water inside the lumen increases so see here water moves passively by diffusion inside the lumen and that's why we see the watery diarrhea okay that's that is uh, responsible for the watery diarrhea now coming to the clinical manifestation so uh, about 75 percent cases are asymptomatic and in 20 percent cases there occurs mild diarrhea there occurs mild diarrhea and uh, severe diarrhea occurs only in case of five percent of cases how does this uh, cholera manifest so manifestation of cholera is the rice water stool this is very characteristic sign of the cholera infection rice water stool whenever you are uh, given this clue of right water stool just close your eyes close your eyes and go for the cholera okay because that is going to be cholera rice water stool occurs only in case of the cholera there will be uh, the what is the characteristic of this rice water stool there will be no pus there will be no mucus or there will be no blood along with that there may be history of vomiting and when the dehydration or when the uh, call uh, this uh, watery stool is not treated with time uh, with continuous dehydration there will occur hypotension weakness sunken eyes shock and coma may also manifest with time if this diarrhea is not treated so in all this video the most important part is the pathogenesis of the cholera so we will see the pathogenesis once again so bacteria uh, when ba with bacteria with load of more than 10 to power 8 bacilli into the food or the water enters inside the gut by virtue of ingestion of the contaminated food and water then it reaches to the epithelial cells how how does it reaches to the epithelial cells so it reaches to the epithelial cells uh, by virtue of the motility and the proteolytic enzymes then what does it do then it adheres to the epithelium of the gastric uh, of the stomach gastric mucosa okay so if it, it adheres to the epithelium of the gastric mucosa by virtue of the type 4 fimbri okay which is toxin coagulated pilus this may also be as in mcq so it binds to the epithelial cells then after binding to the epithelial cells it releases the toxin okay it releases the toxin now that toxin has got two fragments one is the fragment a and the other one is the fragment b that fragment b binds to the gm1 gangliocide and helps in the entry of fragment a into the epithelial cells now that fr uh, fragment a enters into the epithelial cells causes adp causes the causes the ADP ribosylation of the G protein and by virtue of that there is increase in the activity of adenylyl cyclase so that increases the CAMP level inside the cell and as the CAMP level increases inside the cell that CAMP inhibits the uh, Na plus channels and activates the chloride ion channels as a result the Na plus and Cl minus concentration in the lumen increases they uh, those two ions combine to form NaCl in the lumen so as there is formation of NaCl in the lumen there is uh, increased osmolarity in the lumen uh, due to that the water from the mucosa from the uh, gut wall or from the blood vessels enter inside the lumen of the uh, intestine and that causes the watery diarrhea there okay because water concentration increases so this is all about the pathogenesis of cholera now next we will see about the lab diagnosis of the cholera okay so this is all about the pathogenesis